Family values between neoliberalism and the new social conservatism by Melinda Cooper. This is the first part of chapter seven. Theology of the social, the rise of faith-based welfare. Laws which violate the moral law are null and void and must in conscience be disobeyed. That was a quote from Richard John Newhouse from the end of democracy with a question mark at the end. Religious freedom is flourishing in American prisons. In the wake of charitable choice legislation passed in 1996, more than a dozen states have opened faith-based wings in correctional facilities, while several others have created faith and character prisons entirely dedicated to religious instruction. The first American faith-based prison program was established near Houston, Texas, by then-Governor George W. or George W. Bush in 1997. Known as Interchange Freedom Initiative, IFI, the program was run by Prison Fellowship Ministries, a nonprofit set up in 1976 by former Watergate felon Charles Chuck Colson, soon after his conversion to evangelical Christianity. The IFI prison unit was just one of several church-state collaborations commissioned by Bush during his governorship of Texas, part of his strategy to cut state budgets and inject moral purpose into social policy by expanding faith-based welfare across the human services sector. The collaboration assigned the responsibility for shelter, food, and basic security to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice while leaving IFI to design, implement, and fund inmate programs. A division of labor that was calculated to shield the program from the charge of flouting church-state separation. IFI described itself as a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week, revolutionary, Christ-centered, Bible-based prison program. It is open to inmates who are up to two years away from release and is divided into three phases. The first phase, which lasts 12 months, initiates the prisoner into an intensive course of scripture and Christian theology, combined with life skill classes focused on anger management, job preparedness, and responsible fatherhood training. In what amounts to a form of testimonial politics, to borrow a term coined by Tanya Erzin, Participants at this stage are expected to make a public profession of faith in which they acknowledge their sins and accept Jesus as their savior. In the second phase of the program, inmates are required to undertake community service assignments, working for Habitat for Humanity, a religious charity that builds houses for low-income people, or some other faith-based nonprofit. At this point, prisoners are also encouraged to make contact with the victims of their crimes and to seek their forgiveness, a process of restorative justice that is central to Chuck Colson's vision of Christian rehabilitation. The guidance offered by IFI follows the prisoners into the world after release, where he or she is assigned a Christian mentor to help with the practical tasks of finding a job and housing and the long-term goal of refraining from sin. Participation in IFI is voluntary, yet it comes with distinct privileges. Prisoners who transfer into the program have access to private cells with their own keys, their own bathrooms, and the right to conceive family vis- or the rights the right to receive family visits. Their participation guarantees a place in post-release work assignments and is viewed favorably by parole boards. It is also one of the few educational programs now on offer in a state prison system that has dramatically reduced funding for all kinds of vocational and professional training. Bill Clinton summarily abolished the federal Pell Grant system that once funded prisoners' access to higher education as part of his welfare reforms of the mid-1990s. Most states soon followed suit with additional budget cuts. As funding for higher education has dwindled, the federal government and states have invested almost exclusively in prison programs focused on healthy marriage, responsible fatherhood, and religion. In the words of Erzin, 
This form of incarceration expects men to transition from prison as religiously redeemed rather than simply rehabilitated subjects by becoming con conversant in or strengthening already existing religious identities. Faith-based prison reframe imprisonment as a moral issue of individual sin and personal redemption achieved through religious knowledge. During the same period, faith-based organizations have also become heavily involved in so-called prison diversion programs that channel drug users and other low-risk offenders into pedagogical or therapeutic alternatives to jail. One such initiative, known as Project ROSE, reaching out on sexual exploitation, allows women arrested on prostitution charges to enter a faith-based rehabilitation program rather than doing time in prison. Wow. The program is a, collaborative, is a collaboration between Catholic Charities Community Services, Arizona State University's School of Social Work, and Phoenix Police. As part of the state of Arizona, Phoenix has some of the harshest penalties for solicitation in the country and allows police officers to arrest people who manifest intent to prostitute without having exchanged money by, for example, walking the streets, being dressed in a certain way, or engaging with passers-by. Sounds legit. The participants in Catholic Charities Diversion Program are recruited twice a year when the Phoenix Police carry out mass raids over the course of a weekend. Oh. Sounds like they're intentionally funneling people into this charity program, but that's cool. The arrestees are brought in handcuffs to a facility donated by a local church, and as long as they have no prior convictions or outstanding warrants, given the choice of going to prison or undertaking a six-month course with Catholic charities. Apart from offering health care, housing, and other support services to arrestees, Project Rose enrolls them in a program of moral education designed to give hope and help them escape the life. Criminal charges are suspended until the arrestee completes the course. The recent surge in faith-based programs in the American penal system bears witness to a renewed interest in the economic and social value of rehabilitation after a long period in abeyance. Rehabilitative perspectives on crime flourished in the period following the New Deal, a symptom of the general optimism created by rising wages and an expanding social state. During this period, the dominance of socioeconomic theories of crime helped sustain the notion that deviance was a product of social injustice and that at least some prisoners could be appropriately normalized through judicious investments in social work, counseling, and education. By the mid-1970s, however, white middle-class anxieties about the rising costs of welfare and its association with black militancy propelled a permanent tax revolt against the expansionist policies of the great society social state. In this newly divisive context, the once marginal law and order rhetoric of a Barry Goldwater became part of the political vernacular and public opinion turned abruptly against investments in prison rehabilitation. Influenced by a combination of neoliberal rational choice theories of crime and new paternalist visions of civic obligation, the new criminology argued in favor of deterrence-based and, retri and retributive, re retributive, I feel like I'm pronouncing that wrong, but forms of punishment, leading to the new normal of exploding prison populations and extraordinary rates of incarceration across America's former welfare classes. Investments in prison education and other programming plummeted during this period, culminating in Clinton's decision to discontinue the allocation of Pell Grants to prisoners. In recent years, however, the enormous fiscal costs involved in sustaining prisons has persuaded states to, con to reconsider the value of a purely ret retributive vision of crime. Conservative evangelicals have been at the forefront of a prison reform movement calling for a return to rehabilitation. Chuck Colson, for example, has spoken out against inflexible sentencing standards that send first-time drug offenders to jail or mandate long-term imprisonment after three strikes, 
Along with other evangelicals, he has called for further expansion of the prison diversion and drug court system that channels low-risk offenders into alternative rehabilitation programs. When evangelicals call for a return to rehabilitation, however, they understand something very different from the socioeconomic, psychotherapeutic, and ultimately, in the Foucauldian sense, normative vision of reform that prevailed in the post-war era. As explained by Chuck Colson and fellow prison evangelist Pat Nolan, at its root, crime is a moral problem. Offenders make bad moral choices that result in harm to their victims. To break the cycle of crime, we must address this immoral behavior. Job training and education alone will not transform an inmate from a criminal into a law-abiding citizen. For some inmates, such programs merely make them smarter, more sophisticated criminals. It is a changed heart that can transform a prisoner into a law-abiding citizen. Unfortunately, many prison programs ignore the moral aspect of crime and avoid all discussion of faith and morality. In doing so, they are missing a significant factor that has proven effective at changing criminals' behavior, faith. The current resurgence of faith-based prison units is reminiscent of a much older tradition of prison rehabilitation. Historian David Garland writes, The religious influence upon prison reform and penal policy remained a powerful one throughout the 19th century. Evangelicals were in the vanguard of reforming movements both in Britain and in the USA helping to ameliorate conditions of captivity or to aid prisoners upon their release, and later developing alternatives to imprisonment, such as probation, which began as a form of missionary work funded by church-based temperance societies. As Garland reminds us, evangelical social reformers were almost alone in pushing for rehabilitation and prison alternatives in the first part of the 19th century, before they were superseded by social scientific proponents of rehabilitation in the last decades of the century. Alexis de Tocqueville and Gustave de Beaumont were fascinated by the reformative role played by religion in American prisons. Their 1833 treatise on the American penitentiary system includes a detailed account of Philadelphia's Walnut Street Prison, where prisoners were subject to a minute discipline of biblical instruction and spiritual cleansing. In Philadelphia, they remarked, the moral situation in which the convicts are placed is eminently calculated to facilitate their regeneration. A choice of words that points to the historical indistinction between spiritual rebirth and rehabilitation. Tuckville and Beaumont were particularly impressed by the way in which respect for religious freedom enshrined in the First Amendment of the American Constitution reinforced rather than weakened the persuasive force of the religious instruction delivered in these facilities. Tuckville is a mandatory point of reference for today's proponents of faith-based welfare. His remarks on the importance of voluntary association and religious freedom in the early republic are endlessly cited as proof of the American genius for decentralized democracy. Yet Tocqueville's discussion of the Walnut Street prison reminds us that he also discerned an inescapable relationship between the American philosophy of religious freedom and the internalization of moral law. What Tocqueville so admired about the Puritans was their ability to combine civic freedom with a pervasive and inescapable respect for divine authority. This, he thought, was what prevented the decentralization or the decentralized administration of the American Republic from descending into utter chaos. Setting John Winthrop's distinction between natural and civil liberty, he noted that only the latter could be termed moral, in reference to the covenant between God and man in the moral law, because it made freedom contingent on respect for divine authority. It was this close association between civic freedom and moral law, he believed, that defined the singularity of American democracy as against the godless republicanism of revolutionary France. Today, Tocqueville's work affords a peculiar insight into contemporary struggles around the American public sphere, where the prohibitive force of moral law is routinely justified in the name of religious freedom, 
and where the return of strong religion is more likely to appeal to freedom of speech than outright censorship. In interesting contrast to the resurgence of blasphemy laws in Catholic, Orthodox, and Muslim-majority countries. The very concept of religious freedom, as interpreted by Tocqueville, encapsulates the double movement of liberal and conservative tendencies within a certain strain of American republicanism, which sees political freedom as intimately subordinate to moral law. The proliferation of religious programs in American prisons is symptomatic of a much wider transformation of the social services that has seen religious providers actively included in government contracts to provide homeless shelters, soup kitchens, group homes, substance abuse treatment, welfare to work training, healthy marriage, and responsible fatherhood instruction, along with a whole host of other services for the poor. As central as it has been to recent transformations of the social, however, the rise of faith-based welfare has largely escaped investigation by the major theorists of the American welfare state, habituated, no doubt, to the more professionalized and technocratic forms of governance that we as social theorists have come to recognize as the conduits of modern power. The selective silence of social theorists stands in stark contrast to a loquacious and now voluminous literature and post-secular theory that has dedicated itself, seemingly without self-reflection, to the task of wanely reproducing the demands of the religious right, variously calling for a greater deprivatization of religion, a new tolerance for the public expression of faith, and a, threat, and a retreat of something hub hubristic called secular liberalism. This literature appears oblivious to the fact that some of the major theorists of post-secularism, Peter Berger, for example, have, or Berger, Berger, for example, have themselves been key players in the project of faith-based welfare. In the meantime, some of the most renowned figures in political philosophy have conceptualized the return of religion as a messianic, quasi-revolutionary event, perhaps her heralding the final overthrow of capitalism. Instead, I see these literatures as expressions of the status quo and theorize the return of religion as a process of institutional transformation fully internal to the neoliberal conservative state or neoliberal neoconservative state. The rise of faith-based welfare. Why? Why do we need that title again? Anyway. The recent profusion of faith-based social services can be traced to Clinton's welfare reform of 1996, which contained an unassuming provision, Section 104, exhorting federal and state government to contract with, re with religious nonprofits without infringing on their rights to religious expression. The provision, known as Charitable Choice, was sponsored by the former Republican Senator John Ashcroft and drafted by Carl Esbeck a constitutional lawyer specializing in religious freedom cases. It largely escaped the intense congressional and public debate that accompanied the rest of Clinton's welfare reform. Yet, it introduced profound changes to federal law concerning the relationship between church and state and represented a remarkable legislative victory for Christian right leg uh, litigators who had been pursuing a similar agenda in the courts for more than a decade. Overriding regulations established in the 1960s, the charitable choice provision allowed religious organizations, including churches, to contract directly with government agencies without having to form a separate nonprofit and without having to sacrifice the religious character of their services. Organizations that might once have been judged to be pervasively sectarian were now free to express their religious mission in the act of service provision, short of attempting to convert their clients, while churches were no longer required to, to remove religious art, icons, scripture, or other symbols, or alter their form of internal governance to receive federal funds. Appealing to the higher cause of religious freedom, the provision urged government to stop discriminating against religious organizations, while at the same time exempting these same organizations from the Civil Rights Act of 1964, with regard to their employment practices. The shift was real, if subtle. A similar employment-based exemption had been enshrined in Title um, 7 of the Civil Rights Act, 
from the very beginning, but until the passage of charitable choice it did not apply to religious organizations funded by public money. By generalizing this particular exemption to federal and state welfare programs, charitable choice implicitly endorsed the notion, long championed by Christian litigators, that religious organizations alone should be untouched by anti-discrimination laws, an innovation whose full consequences are only now beginning to be felt. The significance of Clinton's 1996 welfare reform for church-state relations went well beyond the charitable choice provision, however. The Welfare Reform Act not only multiplied the number of social service contracts open to faith-based organizations, it also created entirely new programs that were uniquely suited to the sensibilities of conservative, religious organizations. Under the funding rules of the Old Welfare Program, AFDC, only some, ex only some aspects of welfare provision could be contracted out to third sector providers. Under the terms of the new welfare program, TANF, which replaced AFDC, all aspects of welfare prov provision from eligibility determination to child care, job services, and counseling could be outsourced to third parties. While administrative and, lo and logistical services such as data management, electronic surveillance, and child support enforcement were contracted out to private companies such as Lock Lockheed Martin, Maximus, and IBM, Faith-based organizations assumed a prominent role in delivering the soft skills component of welfare provision, including job preparation, substance abuse services, and a whole host of new programs and moral instruction that had not previously been part of, of federal welfare policy. As we saw in Chapter 3, Clinton's welfare reform created dedicated federal budgets to fund healthy marriage programs and allocated millions of dollars in bonus funds to states that could demonstrate they had successfully reduced illegitimate births without increasing abortions. Title V of PRWORA singled out abstinence until marriage as the only responsible form of sex education and provided a generous grant structure to finance such programs. In 2000, Clinton used his executive powers to create the President's National Fatherhood Initiative, a program designed to reinstate the rights and responsibilities of fathers within the family. These initiatives were all closely aligned with the moral politics of religious conservatives, and therefore bound to attract such groups in the process of tendering welfare contracts. The moral politics prescribed by PRWORA have been sustained with remarkable continuity across successive Democratic and Republican administrations. George W. Bush continued to finance the marriage promotion, responsible fatherhood, and abstinence education programs initiated by Clinton, more than tripling the funding for such initiatives during his second term. At the federal level, the various faith-based offices housed in government departments are closely involved in the administration of healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood programs. These programs have not disappeared under Obama, as some had predicted. Instead, Obama has shifted the focus from healthy marriage to responsible fatherhood programs, while doubling the funding for the latter and shifting the focus toward the black family. And while Bush reached out to white evangelicals via the appointment of Wade Horn to a key position in the HHS, Barack Obama made similar outreach efforts to black churches that may be progressives with regard to, to economic justice, with social conservatives when it comes to gender relations within the family. Faith-based organizations have played an indispensable role in the on-the-ground implementation of this state legislated moral politics. If Clinton's charitable choice enacted a formal revolution in church-state relations, Bush fully exploited its, its institutional possibilities. Having failed to secure legislative authority to expand charitable, charitable choice during his first weeks in office, Bush fell back on his presidential executive powers to establish the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. He then went on to create satellite offices in the Department of Labor, HHS, Department of, Department of Housing and Urban, and Urban Development, Department of Education, and Department of Justice each endowed with a carefully selected director and staff. These offices were instructed to facilitate collaborations between faith-based organizations, 
and government by simplifying grant writing procedures, organizing outreach efforts, and offering logistical support. Lou Daly has underscored the extravagance of such a move. No further executive orders were needed to establish the project of faith-based welfare, yet Bush's creation of faith-based offices internal to government departments ensured that religious nonprofits would not only be accepted into tenders for a greatly expanded range of government contracts, but openly favored and courted as preferred partners for certain kinds of contracts. Having accomplished this first step, Bush then commissioned each satellite office to conduct a thorough audit of outreach methods, procurement practices, and internal regulations in their respective departments with the aim of identifying possible obstacles to the inclusion of faith-based welfare providers. In late 2001, the White House published an excoriating report on level playing field, summarizing their findings. The report claimed to have uncovered a culture of pervasive anti-religious discrimination among federal bureaucrats and accused government agencies of adhering to an overly overly zealous interpretation of constitutional law. At a time when the Supreme Court and Congress were adopting a much more indulgent interpretation of church-state separation, the report claimed public agencies went well beyond constitutional restrictions in their efforts to police faith-based welfare providers. These agencies were in fact violating the civil rights of religious providers by infringing on their right to religious expression in public space. It is not Congress, but these overly zealous agency rules that are repressive, restrictive, and which actively undermine the established civil rights of these groups. The report also accused government agencies of favoring the large and entrenched charities that largely had lost their public religious character to the detriment of smaller faith-based organizations whose religiosity was far more conspicuous. In conclusion, it urged federal administrators to take affirmative steps, steps to actively welcome these smaller religious nonprofits among their routine partners. The report repeatedly described religious organizations as victims of systemic civil rights violations and deserving of affirmative action, a nod to the work of Christian litigators who had been perfecting a similar argument in the courts for well over a decade. In response to these directives, each federal department duly revised its internal regulations to help encourage tenders by religious nonprofits and undertook major outreach efforts to help faith-based organizations navigate the logistics of large government contracts. The Bush administration was especially assiduous in its efforts to solicit the participation of the smaller, less experienced, but more conservative evangelical congregations in its faith-based contracts, even going so far as to exclude long-established charities such as Catholic Charities USA, Lutheran Social Services, and Jewish Family Services from its public relations events. Although some of these older charities are themselves well-versed in the arts of public moralism, clearly it was the pervasively sectarian and militant organizations of the new religious right, not those with long-term experience in the humdrum work of large-scale case management, that interested the Bush administration. Bush's faith-based initiative marked a decisive breakthrough in the religious rights' long march through the institutions. Not only did it further expand the range of federal and state contracts upon open to faith-based organizations, but it also consolidated an elaborate infrastructure designed to entrench their position in the social services. There has been nothing like it in the history of the White House or in American social welfare policy observes Lou Daly, himself a sympathetic observer of faith-based welfare. Taken together, the structural and administrative changes carried out by the faith-based initiative, coupled with state-level efforts and grant-seeking mobilizations, represent a massive political effort to reconstruct the social safety net around religious providers and their methods. The charitable choice provision of 1996, followed by the faith-based initiatives of George W. Bush and Obama, have facilitated a dramatic expansion of the number of religious organizations engaged in the provision of social services ranging from homeless shelters, prison and post-prison re-entry programs.
drug rehabilitation services, welfare to work training, disaster relief, and sex abstinence education, along with marriage and responsible fatherhood programs. In the wake of welfare reform, the moral and economic obligations of work and family have been refashioned in the religious idiom of faith, conversion, and redemption. The Great Society and its Discontents, a prehistory of faith-based welfare. The rhetoric surrounding faith-based welfare might lead one to assume that religious charities have only recently and grudgingly been welcomed into the arms of government welfare administrations. As several historians have pointed out, however, the practice of outsourcing social services to religious organizations was not an innovation of the Clinton presidency, but was first implemented, albeit in more restrictive fashion, as part of Johnson's war on poverty in the 1960s. At the time, this represented a significant departure from existing welfare practice. Under the centralized model of welfare provision established by the New Deal, all major social prog programs were administered in-house by federal or state agencies, leaving very little space for partnerships between government and charitable organizations. President Johnson decisively broke with this tradition of bureaucratic centralism by allowing public agencies to subsidize certain kinds of nonprofit institution, hospitals, schools, and colleges, and to outsource key components of welfare programs to nonprofit contractors. Specifically, amendments to the Social Security Act in 1967 dramatically altered the relationship between government and the nonprofit sector by encouraging states to enter into service contracts with voluntary agencies. Religious organizations were some of the major beneficiaries of this shift in structure of welfare provision. Not only did they participate enthusiastically in the urban anti-poverty programs created by the War on Poverty, but their denominational hospitals, schools, and universities also received enormous injections of funding from the creation of Medicaid and Medicare and expanding higher education budgets. As noted by historian Axel Schaefer, these decentralized forms of church-state collaboration appeal to both Catholics, who had a long history of sub subsidiarist welfare provision dating back to the 19th century, and Protestants, who for much of the 20th century had preached a strict form of church-state separation, largely directed against Catholics, but who, know, who now began to perceive the benefits of institutional expansion. During this period, even the most conservative and isolationist of Protestant denominations, fundamentalists, evangelicals, and Southern Baptists, took advantage of this new collaborative environment to build up their network of denominational schools and other institutions. Among the various denominations taking part in welfare programs, the mainline Protestant churches, comprising the Congressional Church, the Episcopal Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church, the United Methodist Church, the American Baptist Convention, and the Disciples of Christ were the most inclined to accommodate themselves to the terms of church-state collaboration, in large part because they were themselves heavily involved in the ongoing expansion of the welfare state. United under the banner of the National Council of Churches of Christ, these denominations were early supporters of Nixon's Black Family Wage, and held views on contraception and abortion that would appear surprisingly liberal in future decades. They also favored strict ideological separation between church and state, even going so far as to support Supreme Court decisions banning prayer and Bible readings from public schools. Conservative evangelicals and Catholics, by contrast, were always ambivalent about the compromises they were forced to make as providers of public welfare, and, as the decade progressed, became increasingly ill at ease with the direction of federal law on issues pertaining to family, sexuality, and religion. Moreover, as evangelicals became more confident about their role in social services, they became acutely aware of the difference between their particular vision of public theology and the social witness of the mainline churches. The changing legal environment was real enough. Beginning in the 1950s, civil rights and civil liberties campaigners turned to the courts as a way of translating political change into legal reform. In 
Finding a receptive audience in a Supreme Court presided over by Chief Justice Earl Warren, progressive lawyers alert to sidestep the conservative stranglehold over Congress by pushing through with highly experimental test case litigation and became increasingly expert at establishing precedents in critical areas of constitutional law. During this period, organizations such as the National Association for the Advancements Advancement of Colored People, NAAC, or NAACP, and the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, along with legal aid offices supported by the National Legal Services Corporation, won key victories in civil rights, criminal procedure, and sexual and religious freedom, using strategic challenges to constitutional law to override established state police powers with regards to racial segregation and the regulation of sexuality. The NAACP's Legal and Educational Defense Fund was one of the first organizations to perfect the strategy of public interest litigation and what marked a turning point in civil rights law. Brown v. Board of Education in 19, from 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that the segregation of public schools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and was therefore unconstitutional a decision that outraged some, but by no means all, Southern evangelicals and fundamentalists. The Legal and Education Defense Fund went on to win a series of test cases challenging the segregation of public spaces such as parks, federally funded hospitals, and even restaurants. The civil litigators of the NAACP were also responsible for popularizing the use of freedom of speech and freedom of association arguments to defend civil rights activism, arguments that would soon be expanded to include sexual expression. Building on the victories of the civil rights litigators and introducing key innovations of its own, the ACLU was instrumental in redefining the legal discourse around sexuality in the late 20th century. In a series of test cases brought before the courts in the 1960s and 70s, the ACLU sought to establish the entirely unprecedented notion that sexual expression was a fundamental civil liberty and therefore deserving of constitutional protection under the Free Speech Clause of the First Amendment. It was the ACLU that first seized, seized on the idea that domestic privacy, a concept long established in state family law, might be reinterpreted, reinterpreted to protect the right to sexual freedom in the bedroom. Having been tested in a number of lawsuits throughout the 1950s, the argument finally bore fruit in a landmark Griswold v. Connecticut case in 1965, overturning a state law criminalizing the sale of contraceptives, and even more emphatically in, in Eisenstadt v. Baird in 1972, overriding the state's police power to limit the sale of contraceptives to married couples. Handing down his opinion for the Griswold v. Connecticut case, Justice William O. Douglas argued that although a right to privacy could not be found in the, in the text of the Constitution, it was implied in emanations from the Bill of Rights. The intimate relation of husband and wife, Douglas affirmed, was a sacred precinct. The idea of allowing the police to intrude here was repulsive to notions of privacy surrounding the marital relationship. The court went a step further in Eisenstadt v. Beard when it extended the right to privacy from the marital couple to the individual, whether married or unmarried. What was new in what in what jurisp what what was new in that jurisprudence explains legal scholar Jean L. Cohen was not the was not the application of the concept of privacy to the marital relationship or to the family construed as an, as an entity. Rather, the innovation lay in the court's attempt to articulate constitutional grounds for directly protecting the personal privacy and decisional autonomy of individuals in relation to intimate personal concerns, whether these arise in the family setting or outside. The litigation strategies developed by welfare rights lawyers were, if anything, even more ambitious than those of their predecessors. Drawing on the ACLU's jurisprudence of privacy and combining it with the due process and equal protection arguments of the NAACP, 
lawyers associated with the National Welfare Rights Organization sought to override state pol police powers with regard to public assistance clients by bringing welfare administration within the confines of the federal constitution. In the late 1960s, the Columbia Center for Social Welfare Policy, in collaboration with an affiliate of the ACLU, won a decisive victory when it accused the state of Alabama of violating the rights of privacy, due process, and equal protection in its use of substitute father rules. In its ruling on the case, King v. Smith, in 1968, the Supreme Court declared that substitute father rules were in violation of the Social Security Act and were therefore unconstitutional. In the wake of King v. Wade, I'm sorry, I don't know why I said King v. Wade, King v. Smith, a string of similar cases prohibited state welfare agencies from policing the sexual behavior of poor women, in the process extending the jurisprudence of sexual freedom beyond family law proper to include welfare law. Going well beyond traditional notions of domestic privacy enshrined in state family law, the new jurisprudence extended the, the presumption of sexual freedom from the rich to the poor, from married to unmarried couples, and from the family unit to the individual, and hence to women, a cumulative legal revolution that was devastating to moral conservatives, particularly in light of the restrictions that were simultaneously being placed on the public expression of religion. Here again, the litigation strategies of the ACLU proved transformative. In two key test cases, Angel Engel versus Vitali in 1962 and Abington School District versus Shemp in 1963, ACLU lawyers convinced the Supreme Court that compulsory prayer and Bible reading in public schools was inconsistent with the First Amendment religion clause. Outlaw outlawing the state establishment of religion. These cases profoundly shifted the balance of constitutional interpretation in favor of strict separationism and continued to define the institutional relation relationship between church and state for the next two decades. Under the terms of the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964, religious nonprofits were free to, de deliver, to, deli to deliver to deliver. <laughs> Publicly, publicly funded welfare services in line with their religious mission, but were theoretically barred from direct expression of their religious character via the display of, script, of scripture and icono, iconography in publicly funded facilities. To conform with these rules, religious congregations and churches were obliged to form a separate nonprofit organization if they were to deliver government social services and could not tender for welfare contracts directly. And in the landmark Lemon v. Kurtzman case, handed down in 1971, the Supreme Court declared that pervasively sectarian organizations could not receive government funding. The decision is considered the high point of legal separationism. The extent to which such rules were actually enforced in practice is questionable. The Lemon decision applied unequivocally to the funding of public and private schools, but was not explicitly extended to the numerous colleges, hospitals, and other welfare services funded under the War on Poverty. Moreover, historians have argued that even the most conservative of religious providers were given free reign to express their pervasively sectarian character during this period, since the strict regulations con governing church-state relations were rarely policed on the ground. Yet in a context where the modernizing Protestant churches enjoyed broad cultural influence, evangelicals and Catholics perceived the Angel versus Vitali and Abington decisions as alarming portents of theological decline. The fact that the mainline churches publicly supported such decisions contributed to their sense of aggrieved isolation. In their retrospective accounts of American moral history, representatives of the religious right routinely identify the progressive Warren Court as the agent of America's spiritual decadence, holding it responsible for ills ranging from the liberalization of obscenity laws to the destruction of the family and the brutal expulsion of religion from public life. But it was the Roe versus Wade decision of 1973 
handed down by the Supreme Court under the rule of the conservative Chief Justice Berger that proved decisive in precipitating the birth of the modern religious right. In Roe v. Wade, the Berger Court built upon and radicalized the previous court's innovations in constitutional law by arguing that the right of privacy should be broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate a pregnancy. In subsequent years, feminist and queer theorists have detailed the profoundly limited nature of this jurisprudence of privacy, pointing to the fact that it favors a gender-neutral understanding of sexual freedom and ignores the disabling effects of sexual inequality on women's sexual expression, that it exists in tension with laws seeking to limit domestic violence and, indeed, certain forms of abuse of sexual freedom in the home, that it confines sexual freedom to the private sphere and thereby legitimates the further criminalization of non-heterosexual or commercial sex in public, and that it was perhaps in any case always meant to protect the sexual and reproductive freedom of heterosexuals only. These critiques are compelling. Yet, for all its limitations, the courtroom sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s undoubtedly played a galvanizing role in the formation of the religious right. The Roe v. Wade decision in particular was the defining moment in the emergence of the religious right, propelling silent witnesses into action and leading to a coalition of forces that would have been unthinkable only a few years previously. This extension of sexual freedoms to include a woman's ability to control her own body was unthinkable for Catholics, who had barely emerged from a decade-long debate about the morality of artificial birth control, but it also proved a step step too far for fundamentalists and evangelicals, and led, in the space of a few years, to a profound reshuffling of denominational alliances around the notion of a right to life. The National Conference of Catholic Bishops had remained silent in the face of Johnson's federally funded family planning clinics, despite misgivings, but it was no longer prepared to compromise on the issue of abortion. In the wake of the decision, the bishops issued a call to civil disobedience and soon secured an official exemption, excusing Catholic health workers from performing abortions or sterilizations, even in hospitals that were publicly funded. This was the first of a series of conscience clause exemptions that religious conservatives would secure over the following decades. The Roe v. Wade decision was no less significant for American Protestantism. Not only did it bring to light profound and irreparable differences between evangelical Protestants on the one hand and the mainline churches on the other, but it also gave rise to a new and unexpected alliance between evangelicals and Catholics. The alliance was unprecedented because American Protestants had traditionally held relatively liberal views on abortion, liberal, that is, by today's standards, and were unmoved by Catholic natural law doctrine attributing sanctity to life itself. Up until the 1960s, even the most conservative of Protestant churches were in favor of legalizing abortion for non-therapeutic reasons within the first trimester of pregnancy. As long as abortion was associated with a familialist, nationalist, and indeed eugenic political or politics of federal family planning, and as long as it was performed for non-therapeutic reasons within the context of marriage, Protestants of all denominations were happy to express conditional support for the liberalization of abortion laws. Population control, after all, was more likely to apply to poor migrant Catholics and African Americans than white Protestants. By the end of the 1960s, however, abortion had to come to mean something very different. Had come to mean something very different. In the years leading up to Roe v. Wade, feminists had redefined abortion as a question of women's sexual liberation from fathers, husbands, and the male-dominated medical profession and had challenged the seemingly inevitable association between female sexuality and childbearing. Alongside feminists, Playboy magazine and the ACLU openly supported the decriminalization of abortion. In the space of a decade, the liberalization of abortion laws had come to represent everything evangelicals most feared – 
and consequently they adopted a new and increasingly intransigent position against abortion at any stage of pregnancy, eventually embracing the Catholic right to life doctrine as their own. It is out of this alliance between evangelicals and Catholics that the modern religious right was born. What the Roe versus Wade decision made manifest to all was the growing rift between evangelicals and the mainline Protestant church, churches. In the following years, evangelicals and fundamentalists refined their stance against abortion and found further reasons for aligning themselves with Catholics, while the mainline denominations continued to affirm and, in some cases, radicalized their positions in favor of legal abortion. Most disturbing to evangelicals was the fact that, it, that the mainline churches routinely grounded their support for abortion in the constitutional doctrine of religious freedom, arguing in effect that personal freedom of conscience with respect to religion implied privacy with respect to sexuality. A year after the Roe v. Wade decision, an association led by Methodists formed the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights, an ecumenical group that justified its support for abortion rights by invoking the constitutional guarantees of privacy and religious freedom. Although many mainline churches continue to place conditions on their support for legalized abortion, the United Church of Christ, a member of the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights, recommended the repeal of all legal prohibitions of physician-performed abortions. For evangelicals, these positions were intolerable. They had barely forgiven the mainline National Council of Churches for supporting Supreme Court decisions, banning prayer and Bible reading from public schools. But the extension of this already privatized doctrine of religious freedom to encompass the private right to sexual pleasure represented an act of outright profanation. These interdenomination these interdominational scissions occurred at times when evangelicals on both the left and right of the spectrum were becoming increasingly aware of their power to affect the formal electoral process. The election of the publicly devout evangelical Jimmy Carter in 1976, along with the rise of the countercultural Jesus generation on university campuses, confirmed a growing intuition that the only unchallenged status of the mainline churches was coming under threat. Evangelicals now understood their power to instate and depose political leaders, and the implications were not lost on their fellow Protestants. In his, 1970 in his 1972 study, Why Conservative Churches Are Growing, Methodist minister Dean Kelly warned the liberal churches that their cultural hegemony was likely to recede before the rising tide of once marginal sects. Like other in-house critics of the National Council of Churches, Kelly wondered aloud whether the diluted religiosity of the modernizing churches was itself to blame for the state of affairs. It was not clear in the early 1970s whether the future of the evangelical movement belonged to the left or right. If anything, it was the social justice left that was most visible to the general public and the most visible to the Oh, and the most active in in oh, fuck in inciting evangelicals to social action. But evangelicals of all persuasions were disillusioned by Carter's failure to assert moral values in any but the most rhetorical of fashions. As the alliance between neoconservatives and neoliberals grew stronger throughout the decade, it was the evangelical right that was bound to reap the benefits. By the end of the decade, new right political strategist Paul Weyrich made overtures to the fundamentalist minister Jerry Falwell, calculating that an ecumenical, ecumenical alliance of religious conservatives under Far Falwell's leadership could be readily recruited into the momentum of Reagan's election campaign. The creation of the moral majority marked the beginnings of an enduring alliance between religious conservatives and free market neoliberals, together forming the so-called New Right, and between the New Right and the Republican Party. Not all religious conservatives were committed to free market capitalism, certainly not the majority of Catholics, and not all neoliberals were religious or indeed social conservatives but their alliance would come to dominate social policy reform over the following decades. <laughs>
What united them was a shared hostility to the new jurisprudence of privacy, which they understood as creating a positive constitutional right to sexual freedom. Neoliberals and religious conservatives opposed this jurisprudence for different reasons. Neoliberals because it appeared to justify the state subsidization of irresponsible life choices among the poor, and religious conservatives because it appeared to undermine the very moral foundations of the family. But while critics on the left have always, and with reason, lamented the restriction of sexual freedom to the private realm, neoliberals and religious conservatives have never been convinced that it would remain there. On the contrary, they feared that the right to sexual privacy would have dramatic transformative effects on the public life of the nation and as such would be, um, and as such should be opposed at all costs. The election of Ronald Reagan heralded the long-term decline of the mainline churches in terms of both numbers and political influence. Over the following decades, evangelicals and traditionalist Catholics would embark on a concerted campaign to wrest the discourse of religious freedom from the mainline churches and redefine it in much more uh, muscular terms. Muscular, that is... A, odd choice of terms but as the right of de as the right of deprivatized religion to impose moral law in the public realm the national council of churches had been a vocal and articulate defender of church state separation in the post-war years but has barely contributed to recent legislative and judicial deliberations around religious freedom effectively ceding the terrain to the religious right. Although mainline religious organizations continue to be major players in the provision of welfare, their influence over the actual shape of social policy has steadily waned after the election of Reagan. As Republicans and New Democrats hewed to the rhetoric of budget crisis and urgent welfare reform, and as mainline congregations began to express political opinions to the right of their leaders, the National Council of Churches found itself on the defensive. By contrast, the voice of the evangelical right resonated closely with the increasingly punitive and pedagogical turn in social welfare reform. As early as 1965, the editor of the major evangelical journal Christian Christianity Today, Carl F. H. Henry, urged his readers to exploit their growing presence in the social welfare arena to counter the modernizing influence of the mainline churches. Writing at a time when the National Council of Churches was still the dominant religious voice in social policy, Henry called on evangelicals to abandon their traditional aversion to politics and claim their true vocation as guardians of moral law. Henry's call to arms foreshadows arguments that would become omnipresent and increasingly strident over the following decades. Protestant liberals, he claimed, had diluted the historic mission of Christian theology by seeking to achieve the kingdom of God on earth by sociological means. The modernist dilution of historic Christian theology in mainline Protestant circles was largely responsible for compromising the message and power of institutional Christianity. By excluding supernatural redemptive facets of the Christian faith, from their social welfare work, the mainline religious organizations had modified the proper content of the Christian ethic and achieved social influence at the price of theological integrity. In the face of this historical abdication, it fell to evangelicals to revive scriptural theology in social welfare. Beyond the material redistribution of wealth, true welfare resided in the distinctly supernatural experience of redemption associated in the evangelical imagination with the experience of being born again. The work of redemption could be achieved only by restoring the family to its proper place within a Christian moral order. The evangelical Christian's social concern is first directed towards the family as the basic unit of society. He finds a hollow ring in the social passion for one world that simultaneously lacks indignation over divorce, infidelity, and vagrancy in the home. Because liberalism fails to see society as a macrocosm of the family, it is bankrupt to build a new society.
In the years following the election of Ronald Reagan, evangelicals strove to redefine the terms of collaboration between church and state, pushing to expand their presence in the social welfare arena, while at the same time refusing the interpretation of privatized religious freedom that had been embraced by the mainline churches. Even as they railed against the sins of the great society welfare state, then evangelicals sought to imagine and eventually implement a form of welfare that would be faithful to the fundamental tenets of Christian morality. In his best-selling Listen, America, Jerry Falwell quoted liberally from Milton Friedemann and called on conservative Christians to mount a united front against left-wing social welfare bills. But even he admitted that welfare was not always wrong, requiring reform, not outright elimination. The moral majority The moral majority's chief strategist, the politically savvy Paul Weyrich, offers a more reliable insight into the long-term social policy agenda of the religious right. A study published by Weyrich's Institute for Cultural Conservatism in 1987 carefully explicated the religious conservative position on social welfare. Cultural conservatives were emphatically not opposed to welfare as such but sought rather to implement a form of cultural welfare designed to inculcate traditional moral values amongst America's poor. To achieve this, the state would need to incorporate churches and their affiliate organizations within the structures of welfare, preferably without infringing on their theological integrity. Instead Instead of leading the fight against welfare, conservatives will lead the fight for it.